Tax One uh, event, 2014-15, uh, and I don't have answers to them. I'm going to raise them, talk about the economic effects of the oil price decline, in particular a little bit about what it means for Russia, and leave some of the questions which are unanswerable at this time just out there as questions. How bad is the Russian downturn? What will the Russian uh, recession, depression do to Europe, the U.S., and world economies? What about the oil dynamics of uh, the oil event and its effects on Russia? Uh, does the risk of a failed country, Russia, in the world order, make a Russian failure or near failure undesirable? Or is it desirable to force Russia to withdraw from what appears to be its expansionist and confrontational ambitions using its economic problems as a lever? Uh, is Russia, does Russia have to be saved by the world order because of its potential uh, damage? Will a hot Cold War emerge by accident or otherwise as a consequence of this? Most of that probably lies with Chairman Putin, who most people would say is a pretty unpredictable guy. Uh, what are the implications for Washington, politics, the federal budget, and the election 2016 of this event, uh, which if it were to evolve into geopolitical and political and more of a hot Cold War rather than a Cold War in economics and finance, would certainly in involve politicians and might even alter the nature of the federal budget, which right now is moving toward less defense uh, in total output. Well, these are relevant questions. The markets deal with this all the time. We saw initially on uh, oil, uh, and we see every day on Russia, the market verdicts of what is going on. And for Russia, the verdict is not negative. I think it is a forecast at the moment that they will go belly up. I've been through it once before with Russia. I actually called them going belly up back when they did. What does that mean? It means the value and the faults to the creditors. That's what countries do when they get in real trouble. They try a whole bunch of things, and then they try to sneak it in on some weekend night when everybody's asleep. And uh, countries in Latin America and everywhere going back for decades have used that uh, mechanism. Uh, so to get to the oil effect, there's a whole sequence of steps that are necessary. Because look, oil prices at $53 a barrel go back up to 80 or 90, suddenly Russia is OK. Uh, and all of what we're talking about in terms of the damage can go away. So the first question, is the oil price decline temporary or permanent? We think it's permanent. Uh, we're now six plus months into it. We expect it to persist for several years. With the disruptive technology shock of fracking, now 30% of U.S. oil production and rising, uh, and an assessment of the geopolitics of OPEC, that's a whole other story, with uh, EMG, emerging country, and European growth quite weak, oil prices we think are permanently lower, and OPEC, as we have known it, is no more. OPEC is history, as we have known it. Second, is it a demand or supply shock? Our assumption is 75% supply, 25% demand. The analysis, brief analysis that follows, uh, is based on supply shock thinking. Uh, if it were a demand shock, the analysis would be quite different. It would be the way the financial markets priced assets for a week or so uh, after the oil prices came down, uh, which probably was a trading event and not fundamental. Uh, uh, our assumption, 75% supply, 25% demand. There's a long story here. It's too long for this session. Uh, and I'll just simply say that is the assumption that we make. Third, what is the path of crude oil prices? We are assuming and forecasting $70 a barrel. We initially said 80, adjusted to 70. We're sitting at $53 a barrel now. Do not go out and buy crude oil based on what Alan Sinai says here about the path of $70. It's a basic path for crude oil prices going forward, thinking that the prices are too low and you can make a quick buck, and then you'll blame me for, for saying $70 a barrel, and I don't want that to happen. The, uh, we get that through uh, disaggregated country demand supply uh, macro econometric models of the oil market. Uh, there are big errors in the, uh, uh, th those results. There's a trading thing that goes on that 
moves those crude oil prices around. There's a dollar effect that moves uh, them around. It's very imprecise, $53, $70 plus or minus 20 with more downside risk than upside risk based on the subjective geopolitical analysis that I bring to bear on this. Uh, so for the U.S. economy, the effects of $70 a barrel oil off uh, what was 110, assumed permanent 75% supply shock, qualitatively get more economic growth, get more jobs net, lose jobs in the energy. Uh, Texas, uh, I don't know if Jamie's here, but Texas might cut off some of the funding to the University of Texas. Times are going to be tough in Texas. Uh, you get a declining unemployment rate, declining inflation rate, overall inflation rate, increased business profits, better, better federal budget deficit, lower inflation expectations, and a lower path for interest rates. These are macroeconometric model results of simulations of oil price declines. Uh, the uh, uh, Federal Reserve has a target of 2% inflation, and so inflation will move away from the target rather than toward the target. They're assuming it's transitory, that we'll have only a one-year downward effect on inflation from this event. We do not agree with that. We think in the system sense there is a tail of effects, and so growth will be improved uh, the following year, and inflation will not come back as fast. The Fed will have to decide how to handle that. They're going to make full employment, maybe pretty quickly, in terms of their dual objective, but they're going to be going farther away from their inflation objective. First time in history, they're going to have to decide how they handle that. Uh, and I don't want to comment on that one today. That's too long for here. So empirically, where we were forecasting for the U.S. economy next year, this year, 3.3%, which already was a very optimistic forecast relative to the consensus, we are now at 3.7%. So the, the oil increment is 0.4 percentage points of additional growth. It would have, in the old days, would have been a lot bigger, but energy is a smaller part of everyone's uh, uh, activity now. The unemployment rate at the end of uh, 2015, 4.9 instead of 5.1. That is already well below the consensus, just so you know, this, these are outlier forecasts before and after. Uh, that would take the Federal Reserve through its full employment unemployment rate assumption of 5.2 to 5.5 range uh, and uh, leave them having to figure out uh, whether we really have reached full employment, redefine the full employment parameters, or simply let it run because inflation is low and just see what indeed the natural rate will turn out to be. Because the inflation rate we have is one and a quarter to one and a half percent, fourth quarter to fourth quarter for this year on the economy and the overlay of the, the uh, oil price event. And if you look at that unemployment rate and that inflation rate, no accelerating inflation, what's the natural rate? Well, a little tough to figure out for those who follow the natural rate in that situation, and a very unusual situation for a central bank with a dual objective that has never faced this kind of situation before, except for a while in the, in the, in the 90s. Uh, fifth, for net oil exporters, depending on how important in, in, in the economy is oil, real trouble, Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia is a low-cost producer. Cost of barrel production thought to be under $10. They can withstand a lot of trouble. Uh, the break-even point on their budget for what they spend, they spend a fair amount of funds, is pretty low, and that's why they are going to, in my view, play the game of shaking out the high-cost producers so at the end of the day, a year or two from now, it'll be the Saudis, Russia, if Russia is still operating, and the United States is the three biggest oil producers, an oligopolistic uh, sellers kind of situation. But the Saudis will be there, and in my view, the strategy they're following is to make sure they're there. Shake the tree, shake out the low-cost producers, cause a little trouble for the shale producers in the U.S., uh, the U.S. Uh, companies are great at lowering costs. They're already smashing the employment rolls, cutting way back. I think they're going to come through pretty well. Russia is uh, uh, the biggest one. The UAE, Kuwait, Iraq, Nigeria, Venezuela, Canada, Norway, Iran, Mexico. These are the net uh, exporters of oil that are hurt the most. Russia is the most vulnerable. By the way, as an aside, the winners. The U.S. is a winner despite the supply side impacts. On the energy sector, 8.5% of the S&P 500 is the energy sector. All those companies, don't buy them. There are no bargains. Stay away until this all shakes out. 
there'll be huge volatility. Uh, only let the uh, real speculators uh, do that, and even they have trouble doing it. Uh, so, the Russian economy. Uh, Pre-oil, we thought flat to down a percent. Post minus five, minus ten. It's a crazy forecast. I, I feel silly kind of even saying that, but it's not impossible. The ruble, it's effectively been devalued by the market. 8,200. It's going to keep going down, and I think one way or the other, it's devalued. Uh, stock market's already down 40 to 45 percent. You don't want to buy Russian stocks for a long time. Interest rates are rising because they're defending the currency. Foreign exchange reserves are coming down. Bankruptcies are starting. The banking system, they're trying to bail out the banking system. <laughs> Debt, external and internal, is a big problem. Business is collapsing. Such countries, the value and default, they go belly up. And that really is the tail risk, is what will Russia do geopolitically and politically in such a situation? And what will that mean to the world? Certainly will shake the markets as something like that might be approached. Uh, and the big unknown, the big question mark, which I leave to the rest of the panel, is what will Russia do in a bad case scenario, not even the worst case, <coughs> a bad case scenario where they essentially go belly up. That's a huge risk. Stephen Walt, Kennedy School. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to focus primarily on the politics and especially the international politics of Russian American relations. Uh, the question we've been asked to address is whether the United States and Russia are heading for a new Cold War and how that can be avoided. I want to take the contrarian view to say that we're not headed uh, for a new Cold War. And that, in fact, invoking the language and the logic of the Cold War is counterproductive, possibly even dangerous in this context. Um, there's no question relations between Moscow and Washington have deteriorated dramatically in recent years, especially the last year. And that's, of course, in sharp contrast to the hopes and expectations many people had back when the Soviet Union uh, broke up. The failure to build a more constructive relationship between Russia and the West, I think, must be counted as a major failure of both Russian and American policy. Uh, I only hope that the two governments will work harder to repair this relationship instead of letting it deteriorate further. I'll say a word or two about that at the end. But our present problems are not at all like the Cold War. And to explain that, I want to first talk about what the Cold War really was and what caused it and then explain why our current problems do not come close to the problems we faced between 1945 and 1992. And then I'll close with a few thoughts on how we ought to proceed. Well, first of all, what was the Cold War? At its essence, the Cold War was a constant, unremitting rivalry between the two most powerful states in the international system. Each side saw the other as its principal rival, each side organized much of its foreign and military policy around that competition. This was largely a zero-sum relationship. Anything that was good for Russia, or the Soviet Union rather, we thought was bad for us, and vice versa. On the American side, we organized an entire system of alliances around the world to help contain possible Soviet expansion. The Soviet Union, of course, formed the Warsaw Pact and also backed its own allies in various parts of the world. This competition was global in nature. We tended to see these various conflicts as interconnected in various ways. And of course, both sides tried to overthrow or undermine the other side's allies and clients on numerous occasions. Now, there were elements of cooperation between the United States and Soviet Union, most notably in arms control. But the underlying relationship was intensely competitive each ultimately sought to defeat the other and to eliminate its system of government. And American leaders saw the collapse of the Soviet Union in the late 1980s, early 1990s as a great strategic victory. My favorite story of this, by the way, is from 1986 when in negotiations, uh, uh, then uh, pr pr President Gorbachev said at one point to George Shultz, U.S. policy is just one of extorting more and more concessions from us. And Schultz looks at him and replies coolly, I'm weeping for you. <laughs> now, what caused this 
intense competition? Well, I think there were several reasons. Uh, the first was structural. The United States and Soviet Union were intense rivals because they were the two strongest powers in the world, and each was the other's greatest potential threat. Each had to worry about what the other might do with all the capabilities it had at its disposal. We'd been reluctant allies during World War II because we saw Germany and Japan as more dangerous, but that cooperation ended very quickly. Second, the two sides espoused radically different ideologies and ones that made the other side seem even more dangerous. American liberals saw any form of dictatorship as illegitimate, saw the communist commitment to world revolution as a sign of dangerous intentions, it was also very easy to exaggerate. All we just had, have to do is think about the McCarthy period here in the United States, where people genuinely believed that the communists were subverting all sorts of American institutions and there was a really a mortal threat to our freedom and independence. Of course, Marxism, Leninism openly identified capitalism as the source of imperialism, injustice, and oppression. So you have a traditional great power rivalry that is intensified by this very sharp ideological divide. I would argue, just as a footnote, that ideology led both sides to make a number of big mistakes, but that's another story. Third, this rivalry was intensified even further because at its core, each side's grand strategy, its sort of foremost strategic objectives, was incompatible with the others. American goal was to maintain hegemony here in the Western Hemisphere and prevent any single power from dominating the Eurasian landmass goes back to at least the turn of the century, if not before. And in practice, that meant the policy of containment, keeping the Soviet Union from dominating Europe or Asia, which meant close alliances with other countries in Europe or Asia, like Japan, Germany, France, the United Kingdom. The Soviet grand strategy was, of course, to keep enemies, to keep hostile powers as far away as possible, not to have any powerful hostile states anywhere near Soviet territory. So they want no hostile states anywhere nearby, while the United States wanted to make sure that there were countries that the Soviets didn't control still in Europe or Asia. In other words, if containment worked, Soviet Russia was going to feel insecure. If containment failed, the United States was going to feel insecure. There was a fundamental tension of what each side's geopolitical objectives were. And then finally, it was further fueled by concerns about long-term power trends, and especially the American fear that someday the Soviet Union might catch up. Uh, the Soviet detonation of a nuclear weapon in 1949 was the first moment where we thought maybe they were catching up. The spread of communism in Eastern Europe and to China, the Sputnik launch in 1957, the American defeat in Vietnam, etc. Now, I would argue in most of those cases, American fears were exaggerated, but nonetheless, they helped make the Cold War seem especially intense and dangerous. Now, if that's our background, if that's the historical baseline, I think it's clear we are not facing a Cold War today. First of all, we're not talking about a bipolar world, or if it is a bipolar world, Russia is not one of the poles. <coughs> the U.S. economy is now about $16 trillion, Russia a bit more than $2 trillion. Uh, as has already been mentioned, China, Japan, Germany, the United Kingdom, Brazil all have larger economies than Russia does. Russian defense spending is going up to $81 billion, uh, projected for next year. That's dwarfed by the American defense budget of approximately $500 billion. In fact, not counting the United States, NATO's European members spend four times what Russia spends on defense uh, every year. The Russian economy, as has already been noted, is dependent on raw material exports, most notably oil and gas. It's not diverse. It's not producing export products except arms. So in the Cold War, we worried about the long-term balance of power. Maybe someday the Soviet Union would get ahead of us. Today, Russia is a declining power. It's simply not a major strategic threat of the sort we faced in the Cold War. And if the United States does face a future competitor, it's going to be China, not Russia. Second, there's no ideological conflict here. Russia is now a capitalist economy, albeit one that's quite inefficient and corrupt. Now, although Putin has recently been extolling Russia's unique cultural qualities, 
contrast, say, to Western-style liberalism. This is not a revolutionary ideological program that is likely to command the loyalty of millions of followers around the world, as Marxism once did. Nobody in the United States is going to worry about Putinist infiltration of key American institutions, <laughs> the way we once worried about communist subversion. In fact, to the extent that anybody worries about subversion, it's of course Russian fears that the United States might try to spread our version of liberal democracy and possibly overthrow the current Russian state. Uh, we aspire to another color revolution this time in Moscow. Third reason this is not a Cold War, the issues we're contending over here are much smaller. During the Cold War, there were genuine reasons to worry about, say, the future of democracy in Europe, the alignment of Germany over time, the possible spread of communism in the developing world. Now, without wanting to minimize the situation in Ukraine, this is not the sort of issue over which the global balance of power is likely to hinge. Ukraine's economy is about the same, as the same size as the state of Kentucky. And whether it is part of the West, part of the East, or neutral, is just ultimately just not that important. Other issues, finally, are more important. Um, Counterterrorism remains a bigger concern for us. It's one where Russian cooperation can be helpful. Resolution of the Syrian civil war, and in fact, What's happening throughout the Middle East, I think, is arguably more important to us than what's happening between us and Russia. And remember that Putin did bail the Obama administration out over the chemical weapons issue in Syria. Dealing with Iran, I think, looms larger on our agenda. And our long-term strategic competition with China is also probably a bigger concern as well. So from a purely strategic point of view, the United States and its various allies have ample reason to keep disagreements with, with Moscow within bounds, not to have anything that might look like a Cold War. So what implications do I draw from all of this? Well, we clearly have serious differences with Russia, but we are not on the verge of a new Cold War by any meaningful sense of that term. Second, this sort of historical analogy, rather crude historical analogy, I think is counterproductive it makes Russia look more dangerous than it is. It makes us less likely to look for constructive solutions to the issues that divide us. And finally, it encourages us to do what we did in the Cold War, which is, of course, to blame all the problems on Russia, and in particular, to pin all of the blame on Vladimir Putin himself. This, unfortunately, unfortunately this perspective tends to downplay the role Western actions have played in this deteriorating relationship and ignores, in particular, how our actions look to Russia, something Lord Skidelsky already alluded to. Now, I am not defending Russia's action um, over the past year or more, but its behavior should not surprise us at all. It's not that different from the behavior of other great powers. All great powers are sensitive about their borders. They don't like potentially hostile powers nearby. All you have to do is think of the mighty United States, which is an extremely secure country, yet has intervened repeatedly in Latin America to keep hostile powers away. Since 1992, the United States and NATO has expanded steadily eastward, despite constant Russian objections, and we've made it clear that this is an open-ended process from our point of view. It's also clear we were not neutral in the conflict inside Ukraine. And I don't know of any great power that would have been indifferent to that process, no matter who was in charge. Um, the United States, and I would argue the EU, erred not by taking these possibility into account and at least thinking that maybe Russia would do something to stop it, however much we may disapprove of what they did. Now, the deterioration in relations has been very costly for Russia, but of course, also very damaging to some European countries, and of course, extremely hard on Ukraine itself. And finally, as uh, Alan just mentioned, we should recognize that driving Russia into a corner and weakening its government further through sanctions could eventually create more problems than it solves, as we have seen in several other contexts, failed states tend to be a tr trouble, and a failed state the size of Russia would be a huge nightmare. So my bottom line here is we should talk, start talking less about a new Cold War and more about whether we can devise political solutions that will stabilize Ukraine, allow Ukrainians to start rebuilding their country, 
and allow Russia and the West to cooperate where we can and where we should. Thank you. Tonight's project on uh, defense alternatives. Uh -huh. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to address this important topic. Um, the notion of a new Cold War is uh, only a couple years old now. Um, it is new enough that it is not yet fully constructed. Uh, we don't know what uh, this new framework for thinking will encompass. Um, and I think uh, that means it's early enough that we can uh, perhaps work to avoid it. I think that would be a very good thing to do. Um, I believe it is a costly, unnecessary, and <coughs> dangerous construct to apply to a uh, situation in relation to Russia. Um, now, I'm going to focus mostly on the costs accompanying a Cold War construct. And I'm going to start with the original Cold War, um, which amplified, displaced, and generalized the post-World War II tension between the USSR and its for former Western allies. Um, as it, it developed, it infected and transformed international relations globally, undermining potentials for any integration uh, across those borders. Um, it uh, destroyed opportunities for cooperation everywhere, and that includes most every field of human endeavor, including commerce. It fed on itself, rendering many lesser disagreements and disputes intractable once they were sucked into the dominant framework of a highly militarized conflict. From a global and historical perspective, I would assert that it is an inefficient and destructive dynamic. In terms of accountable costs, the Cold War likely added at least a half trillion dollars in current dollars, 1914 dollars, 1915 dollars, to annual global military expenditures averaged over the course of its more than 40 year span. Shares that disproportionately were paid by Russia and the U.S. Perhaps one to two percent of global GDP diverted to military capabilities particular to the Cold War. There were roughly 100,000 American deaths in the hot corners of the Cold War. 30 million people died in 35 major interstate and civil wars across the globe. Many, not all, of these peripheral conflicts were encouraged and provisioned by the Cold War protagonists. To this accounting, we should add the costly mischief carried out over 40-some years by civilian and military operatives on both sides. I would also add to this two costs which are probably impossible to quantify. First, the Cold War was a totalizing construct meant to mobilize this country and on the Russian side, that country as well, to confront particular threats. To a large extent, it was quite successful in that regard. A significant portion of the creative energies of a generation or two of Americans and allied peoples were marshaled to the cause. At what cost to other possible endeavors? I would suggest that cost is significant. Secondly, enormous fears were induced in Americans and Russians in order to gain their consent for this program and to marshal their energies. The narratives feeding these fears were so often repeated that fear, the fear response in much of the public became automatic, often feeding on itself into more complex and fantastic convolutions of fear. A sort of collective neurosis resulted, which undermined society, societal capacity for rational action, critical thought, and efficient allocation of resources. These sorts of costs don't get into most economic measures, but that doesn't mean that they aren't there. They represent a collateral cost of Cold War, Now, I'm not going to take uh, time in my brief remarks to get into 
uh, last year's Ukraine crisis, which uh, is the uh, opening, uh, is the incident that opened the way to the notion of a new Cold War. Um, rather, I'm simply going to assert, and uh, other speakers have uh, in a way supported this position, that uh, the annexation of Crimea and the active support of secessionist rebels in eastern Ukraine is not the beginning of some broader Russian aggression toward nations to its west. Russia has neither the wherewithal nor any interest in beginning a general war in eastern or central Europe. It's simply a fantasy. The combined economic capacity and the mobilizable military power of the U.S. and EU countries is many times that of Russia. Russia cannot win a war with the West, and Moscow surely knows this. If that's not uh, on the Moscow's agenda, then why the specter of a new Cold War? Why hasn't the specter of a new Cold War been raised? Probably a good part of the answer is that it's such an easy, ready, and convenient trope for media commentators in need of dramatic content. It's, it's ready and available. We all respond to it. But it also serves very well to argue for more military investments. I offer you three examples of how the new Cold War construct is and will be used by advocates of higher investments in a militarized foreign policy. First, the Ukraine crisis, the apparent Ru Russian menace, and even better, a new Cold War to give it a longer term and grander framework, provide good political argumentation for the present bipartisan supported program of getting the Pentagon budget back on its fast growth path following the inadvertent modest budget decreases caused by the Budget Control Act's sequester provisions. The new Republican Congress will likely present the President this year or next with legislation to revise the BCA to exempt the Pentagon from further funding sequestration while keeping domestic spending tied down, down under caps. Now the left of the Democratic Party will call on the President president to veto such legislation. On the other hand, I suspect that Hillary Clinton will lobby the president to accept the Republican-sponsored legislation in order to take defense spending off of the campaign issues for 2016. Mm -hmm. One thing we can be sure of, that language such as, with the new Cold War with Russia, we cannot any longer afford caps on Pentagon spending, will be repeatedly deployed this year and next uh, in all sorts of political areas. We are already hearing language very much like that. Secondly, NATO does not need to spend more on its militaries to defend Europe from Russia or any other regional threat. 